It's wonderful to be back here. I've come here numerous times. I've done research here. This is a, a, a great institution, a beautiful place, and uh, I'm just thrilled to be back. Last spring, I published a book on the age of Eisenhower, a book that examines the decade of the 1950s through the presidency of Dwight Eisenhower. And I've been on the road more or less nonstop since. It's been a wonderful experience. I've been out talking to uh, audiences like this about Eisenhower, his presidency, and his legacy, and what we can learn from him, if anything, today. I found there's a real hunger for uh, leadership uh, in the country the, of the kind that not just Eisenhower gave us, but his, the, 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 the leaders of his era. Uh, of that mid-century, uh, uh, extra the extraordinarily gifted leaders of the mid-century that, that helped uh, us accomplish so much. Figures like Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, and Eisenhower, of course, and public servants like Dean Acheson and, of course, George Marshall. These men guided the country through so much extraordinary turmoil. It's amazing what the, the challenges that they faced, but also what they accomplished in, in meeting those challenges. They laid the groundwork for American global leadership. The world these men made is coming unglued. And uh, the, the question is, what can we learn from them, if anything, to help us guide ourselves as we're going to face our own challenges in the coming years ahead? Is there anything we can draw from them, from their example? Dwight Eisenhower, I think, can provide some inspiration. Now, I'll just say that to, 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 to many people, um, uh, uh, many of my students especially, let's just put it this way, people may be born uh, in, the, in the Clinton administration rather than in the Eisenhower administration, uh, Eisenhower is not a well-known figure. If I were to show these uh, photographs to my students, they might not know who this is. They might, if they could name him, say that he was probably president and if they, could, if they knew that, then they really knew a lot. And they might know that he, was, he, was, he was, uh, played a lot of golf and that he, was, he had a pretty easy time of it because it wasn't the 50s such a relaxing, peaceful, prosperous time. <laughs> well, what I've shown in my book is that Dwight Eisenhower was an enormously consequential leader for the country. In foreign affairs, he implemented the strategy that would wage and win the Cold War, a policy of peace through strength. He built the United States into a global colossus, never before seen power, not even during the Second World War. Uh, he strengthened a network of global alliances that helped America um, build, uh, build, build alliances and build friendships around the world. And yet Eisenhower always, and this is so interesting for a professional uh, military man, always preferred diplomacy to war and to conflict. And he, went, he really worked hard on trying to uh, develop a relationship with his counterpart, his Soviet counterpart, Nikita Khrushchev, going so far as to invite Khrushchev to the United States in 1959. He hoped that he would be able to return the visit and go to the Soviet Union in 1960, but it never happened. If you want to know that story, you can ask in the Q&A. At home, at home, so that's foreign policy, at home Eisenhower blended the best of both parties, I think. He balanced, wow, get this, he balanced three budgets. I mean, even balancing one budget is quite an accomplishment, but he balanced three budgets out of eight, came pretty close on the other five. So he had a, a record of fiscal stewardship that is almost unparalleled. Uh, Bill Clinton had a good period there for a bit with some balanced budgets, but Eisenhower's record on fiscal stewardship is hard to, hard to match. He also, and this was a surprise given how he ran in the campaign, he embraced key aspects of the New Deal and Social Security, expanded Social Security, invested in infrastructure, in housing, in highways. He raised the minimum wage. He created the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. He invested in education and in science. He passed the National Defense Education Act, and he founded NASA, or he had NASA, brought NASA into creation in 1958. These were signs not of a golf playing snoozing, uh, relaxed Ike, but of an active, creative, innovative president, which I believe he was. Eisenhower also took important steps in the field of civil rights, an area he knew nothing about, did not anticipate having to confront, but shaped in significant ways. After his election, he pushed through the desegregation of Washington, D.C. 
He followed President Truman's lead in completing the desegregation of the U.S. military, and of course he appointed Governor Earl Warren as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. An enormously consequential decision because it would be Warren that would author the unanimous decision of the court in 1954, Brown v. Board of Education, uh, mandating the desegregation of public schooling. Eisenhower's administration also passed the Civil Rights Act of 1957, the first such law since 19th century, since Reconstruction. It gave increased powers to the Justice Department to pursue voting rights violations. And of course, in 1957, Eisenhower used his authority as Commander-in-Chief to send in the 101st Airborne to Little Rock, Arkansas, to accompany black students who were trying to go to school uh, and who were being blocked by the uh, state authorities in Arkansas. So the record shows that Ike uh, struck numerous blows uh, in the field of civil rights as well. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's an amazing record. It's a strong record, a strong of real achievements, of consequential leadership in the, in the decade of the 1950s. And I would love to talk more with you about some of those specifics, anything that might interest you about his, uh, his leadership in the 1950s. But today, I want to talk about one theme in particular. I don't get a chance to talk much in detail about any one theme when I'm out talking up the Ike book because everyone wants to, to know a little bit about everything. And today it seemed to me appropriate to come to the Marshall Foundation and talk about Marshall and in particular the relationship between Eisenhower, George Marshall, and Joseph McCarthy. And that's going to be the focus of my comments today. I will just say right at the outset that I've given a very positive appraisal in my book of Eisenhower's leadership and I think that's fair. But Eisenhower was human. And Eisenhower could make mistakes. And Eisenhower had blind spots. And this was one of them. I'm often asked, and it's only reasonable, why didn't Dwight D. Eisenhower do more to back General George Marshall? Why didn't he do more to go and confront, go toe to toe with the horrible demagogue of the era, Senator Joseph McCarthy, the man who slimed the reputations of so many Americans? Why didn't Ike? do more? Why didn't he defend Marshall in particular? And these are fair questions, and I want to take a little time to get into them and, and to unpack them a little bit and to put them back into a historical context, not to justify Eisenhower's choices, but to explain them. I just want you to be able to follow along and see why did Eisenhower make the choices that he did, and you can judge whether he made the right ones. In order to understand the history uh, uh, here and the story of Eisenhower and Marshall and McCarthy, I think we have to go back and put the whole thing in a broader context. And that broader context is the fact that the Red Scare and McCarthyism was part of a much longer and deeper history of anti-communism in the United States. Anti-communism had flourished in the United States since the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, and American leaders from Woodrow Wilson on depicted communism as a lethal threat to the nation all across the first half of the 20th, the whole, really the, the entire 20th century. They depicted it as a, communism as a secretive, atheistic, and revolutionary ideology that there was directly antithetical to American <coughs> values of freedom of speech and freedom of religion and ownership of private property. American leaders linked communism to other somewhat anxiety-producing social movements, hostility towards immigrants, union workers, labor organizers, anarchists, socialists, feminists, the whole lot of them was all mapped onto fear of communism itself. These fears led to the suppression of dissent not just in the early 50s, but throughout much of the beginning of the century. The passage of the Espionage Act of 1917 and the Sedition Act of 1918, the deportation of radicals and critics of American power and American policy. Woodrow Wilson's Department of Justice arrested and deported hundreds of leftists and radicals. Popular images of, images of communists depict, depicted them variably as infectious mosquitoes over on the right or, 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 or sinister web-spinning uh, 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 spiders. During the 1930s, as the world slipped into the economic, global economic crisis, communism drew more and more adherents. They felt capitalism was failing. Capitalism was on its deathbed, and many leftists and radicals said, look, Look what the Soviets are doing. Look how rapidly they're industrializing. Maybe communism has the answer. Mind you, not a huge number, but as many as 50,000 people in the United States joined the Communist Party in this period, in the 30s. In 1938, the Congress created the House Un-American Activities Committee. It's actually the 
House Committee on Un-American Un 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 Activities, but HUAC just sounds better, so we'll just go with that. The, the House on american Activities Committee, which along with the FBI under J. Edgar Hoover sought to expose the penetration of the U.S. labor movement by communists. The Congress passed the 1940 Smith Act, making it a crime to advocate the overthrow of the U.S. government. Again, containing speech, controlling it. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover told the House Un-American Activities Committee in 1947 that communism stands for the destruction of democracy and free enterprise. It was aiming to trigger a bloody revolution in the United States. This is 1947. Communists, he said, were disruptive, secretive, immoral, disciplined, ruthless, subversive, hidden. They used propaganda in films and books and teaching materials, the classroom, etc. Watch out, they're behind you. They might be in the jam cupboard. They're certainly under the bed. They're everywhere. The solution, Hoover declared, was old-fashioned Americanism and eternal vigilance. Whatever old-fashioned Americanism is, I guess Hoover knew it when he saw it. And it wasn't communism, wasn't consistent with communism. And the Truman administration, again, the Truman administration responded to this. They created a loyalty security board that screened federal employees looking into their records for signs of derogatory uh, information or, or dalliances of one kind or another. The Truman administration purged 12,000 federal workers from the government in the late 1940s. Now here's the wrinkle. Even though we all know that J. Edgar Hoover was an, an unsavory character and was obsessed with communism and anti-communism, one has to remember that in 1948 and again in 1950, U.S. officials discovered, good gracious, communists had in fact penetrated the United States government. They had in fact penetrated the atomic weapons program. They had in fact stolen secrets out of the Manhattan Project. They penetrated the State Department and they penetrated the Treasury. That made it awfully difficult to wipe away and whisk away claims of, of communist subversion. So that was the problem with every Every big conspiracy, maybe there's a kernel, and in this case, more than a kernel of truth. In 1948, a leading State Department official named Alger Hiss was identified as one of those spies, and the Congress held hearings to uncover the truth. A tough, young congressman from California named Richard Nixon made his name by tripping up Alger Hiss during the uh, HUAC uh, committee hearings into Alger Hiss's behavior. Nixon was only 35 years old in 1948 at this time. He became a national political figure overnight by unmasking the elite, debonair, uh, highly educated, sophisticated Roosevelt era State Department employee, Alger Hiss. International events also stirred up a great deal of anxiety in the country. In 1949, the Russians tested their first atomic bomb. And the communists took power in China following a long and bitter civil war. And the Korean War broke out in 1950, making it seem, all of these things taken as a whole, make it seem as if global communism is on the march and America is playing defense. All this, ladies and gentlemen, is what set the stage for Joseph McCarthy. In February 1950, he was still a quite unknown senator and he gives the infamous speech in Wheeling, West Virginia, Basically stealing much of that material not, uh, right out of Nixon's playbook, actually. If you, you can compare the speeches and they're quite similar. He gives the infamous speech in Wheeling, West Virginia, in which he announces that he had shocking new evidence that 205 employees of the State Department were, were members of the Communist Party. The claims were false. They were absurd. He would back off of them. He would never give the same number twice. You know that story. But nobody in this atmosphere of heightened anti-communism wanted to say, oh, it can't be true, it's ludicrous. No, what they said was, if, that's, if any of that's true, we need to do something about it. The Congress passed the Internal Security Act of 1950, gave enormous federal powers to the federal government to investigate subversive activities. And Joe McCarthy has found his topic. He's found political gold, as far as he is concerned. He goes after the Truman administration. He attacks the striped pants diplomats, which is one of those phrases my students have no idea what that means. <laughs> but you all know what the striped pants are, the striped pants diplomats. And he goes after Dean Acheson, who fails to halt the communist menace. Most astounding of all to us in this place, in this room, June, 19, June 14, 1951, 
In a Senate speech, McCarthy launches a savage attack against none other than George C. Marshall, who was then serving the Secretary of Defense. Marshall, the Army Chief of Staff during World War II, the architect of the European recovery program that bears his name, was among the most distinguished Americans of his generation. And McCarthy went after him for his association with Roosevelt, his association with Truman, his association with Acheson, their, their alleged coziness with Stalin at Yalta. The long list of, of accusations came forward. In particular, he went after Marshall for the quote unquote loss of China because Marshall had, taken, had carried that mission to China in 1946, seeking to make a compromise between the forces of Chiang Kai-shek and the forces of Mao, the communists. He had failed, but eventually, in 1949, the communists win. Someone must be responsible. Who was there at the, at the key moment? Who didn't do enough to back Chiang Kai-shek? Who let Mao run over the, the, the nationalists? It must have been George Marshall, a puzzle. Even to this day, it's hard to figure out the sense of that accusation. That was one of McCarthy's many accusations. The whole thing smelled of a conspiracy. And in fact, in that speech, he claimed that Marshall was part of a conspiracy so immense as to dwarf any venture in the history of man. Wow. Wow, indeed. The charges by McCarthy were false. They were cruel. Marshall kept quiet about them. He knew from long experience that Washington was a snake pit, a, vis a vicious and nasty place, and Marshall wasn't going to have anything to do with it. The sad truth is that in 1950, in 1951, in 1952, McCarthy, and this is a point that is often lost, McCarthy was popular in the United States. He was popular, not 100% approval ratings, but consistently his message and his style found an audience in the United States. This is a man who was reelected twice in Wisconsin, a relatively progressive state. But even in the country, many people looked to McCarthy and they said, hey, that guy is tough. That guy's a truth seeker. He's a former Marine. I bet you there's something there. Where there's smoke, there's fire, et cetera, et cetera. McCarthy had an audience in the country, and he knew he was going to deliver red meat to it. All of this forms the background to the election of 1952. And that's why you can't just start in 52. You've got to know the, what's going on, what's happening in the environment when this election uh, unfolds. We have a misconception about the 1952 election, and Eisenhower in particular. He just walked to the presidency. He just yawned and strolled and smiled his way into the White House. Nothing could be further from the truth. Eisenhower didn't, not only was it not easy to win the presidency, it was not easy to win the Republican nomination in 1952. He had to beat Robert Taft, Mr. Republican, Senator Taft from Ohio, before he could even get into the fight with Adlai Stevenson. Why is that? Because the Republican Party in 1952 was still quite a conservative party. It had a lot of leaders in it who were from the old guard or the right wing of the Republican Party. It was still in many ways the party of Herbert Hoover. And it was certainly, a big chunk of it was the party of Robert Taft. And they did not appreciate this newcomer whose party they, allegiance they didn't even know until 1951 coming in and getting all the votes. So in 1952, this is key. In 1952, Eisenhower doesn't run as the happy-go-lucky moderate that he, that he actually governed as. He ran as a conservative. I've gone back and gone through all of his speeches through the 1952 election. He ran as an anti-New Deal, anti-Roosevelt, small government, cut the taxes, conservative. Not that all the way he governed, but that's how he ran in 1952. He denounced the New Deal as a creeping dictatorship. He used that word again and again and again. He was trying to prove himself to the right wing of his party that he could be counted on to push back against the bloated budget deficits of the Truman years and the welfare programs of the Roosevelt years. What, after all, was his first act after winning the nomination? Well, you've got to find a running mate. What about that young, tough, hard-charging, anti-communist senator from California, Richard Nixon? That's his first choice, is to get Nixon on the ticket. Now, Eisenhower's opponent, 1952, Adlai Stevenson, he uses this extreme partisanship against Eisenhower. And he says, you're way, too f uh, you're, you're way out of the mainstream. You're too far right. And in particular, Stevenson goes after Ike and says, so what about Joseph McCarthy? What are you going to say about him? Do you want him? He's also running for re-election in 52. Do you want him to get in? Do you support McCarthy's election? 
And by the way, why haven't you stood up and said anything against McCarthy in, and in favor of General Marshall? So Eisenhower's opponent in the election is using the Mar Marshall McCarthy stuff against him. Now everybody knew then, as we know today, that General Marshall made Dwight D. Eisenhower. Without Marshall, there's really no Eisenhower. And that was known at the time, and the press knew it. And they badgered Eisenhower during the campaign, and they also said, what about McCarthy? What about McCarthyism? What about Marshall? Why haven't you responded? The press picked up the theme, and they did push, push on, on Ike pretty hard. And that led Eisenhower to say in August of 52, it's still, still, um, the campaign is still underway, he did say in a press conference that General Marshall was a great patriot, and there is, quote, nothing of disloyalty in General Marshall's soul, unquote. But Eisenhower went on to say that since he, Eisenhower, was now the leader of the Republican Party, he wanted to see all Republicans elected to the Congress who were running, and he would work on their behalf. And that included Joseph McCarthy running for re-election in 1952. That's called waffling, people, and that's a, that's a mushy answer. Well, in early October 1952, the, the, the mushiness and the waffling is going to get Ike into trouble. The tr campaign train rolls into the battleground state of Wisconsin. Really was, of course, a campaign train back then, and it rolled into October. The Eisenhower Special was called. Wisconsin had 12 electoral votes, and the 1948, the previous election, it had gone Democratic. So it's a battleground state. It, Certainly had a tradition of progressive politics, but it also had elected Joseph McCarthy in 1946. If Ike wanted to win Wisconsin in the fall of 1952, he was going to need McCarthy's support to do it. That was the rationale in the Eisenhower, uh, the Eisenhower team. Even the moderate Republican governor of Wisconsin at that time, uh, Walter Kohler, he loathed McCarthy hated him, mortal enemies. Even he endorsed McCarthy for re-election in 1952. So there's not a portrait full of heroes. Eisenhower's five-city whistle-stop tour in Wisconsin was therefore going to be a tense one. He was privately, Eisenhower was privately very bitter about, about McCarthy and especially about the accusations against Marshall. And so Eisenhower's team of speechwriters, the speechwriters were mostly located in New York. They were mostly Dewey people. They were mostly people from the, from the liberal wing of the party. They thought going into Wisconsin and giving a humdinger of a speech in favor of George Marshall was a great idea. And that they would, that would, and there, there would be McCarthy and it would be a slap in the face and the country would love it and they would rally to Eisenhower and he'd win in a landslide. That was their argument. And they wrote a speech for Eisenhower that was critical of the Democrats, but had a paragraph in it that was very complimentary about Marshall. In part, that speech read as follows. They, so the, the speechwriters want Ike to say this in Wisconsin. I was privileged throughout the years of World War II to know General Marshall personally as Chief of Staff of the Army. I know him as a man and a soldier to be dedicated with singular selflessness and the profoundest patriotism to the service of America. You wouldn't think that'd be very controversial. But the night before the speech is set to be given, McCarthy knows Ike is coming into his state. He goes and seeks him out. He goes and sees him at his hotel in Peoria, Illinois. And he knows this speech is in the offing. And McCarthy asks the general to omit the passage. Senator McCarthy says to General Eisenhower, don't say that. Eisenhower is outraged. He says, get out of here. I don't know who you are. I don't know. You have the presumption here. It's outrageous. It's terrible. Off with you. But the next day, as the campaign train travels into Wisconsin, McCarthy jumps on board the campaign trail. And he appears on the back platform alongside General Eisenhower. During the day, the two men stood side by side on the back of the train, speaking to crowds at five stops. And here we have Eisenhower um, speaking and uh, Governor Kohler, and here's Joe McCarthy, smiling and grinning as if everybody's having a lovely time. Inside this very train, at this very moment these pictures are being taken, a fierce debate was going on. And Governor Kohler was urging the Eisenhower team to change the speech that Eisenhower was supposed to give that night. It's going to be a problem. It's going to blow up. Don't do it. Take the passage about Marshall out. 
The New York team of speechwriters are clattering in on the cable saying, what, you're crazy. It would be, why buckle to McCarthy? We're going to win so much national acclaim by doing this, by standing up for this man. Everyone loves Marshall. You'll win such, such support. Eisenhower buckled. He allowed the sentences of support for General Marshall to be removed. We even have the speech. There are many drafts of the speech circulating in the Eisenhower Library, and I've looked at as many as I could, and I was struck to find one with the offending passage actually scratched out. Why did he do it? The answer that we often read in the books and that the Ike people put out later was that he was a novice in politics. He didn't really know what he was doing. He, he just left it to his underlings. I think that's wrong. I think Ike knew exactly what he was doing. He made a political decision to side with the old guard and the right wing of his party in order to keep the party united. He felt if he went directly after McCarthy in such a provocative way, it might hurt the party. It might hurt the control of the Senate. It might even hurt Eisenhower's president, presidential campaign. So that night, he went to Milwaukee, and he gave a stem-winding speech that was critical of Truman, and it did not have the comments about Marshall in it. Well, you know how this turns out. Eisenhower had not anticipated that the content of the speech had already been leaked to the press. <laughs> Journalists were told to expect favorable comments about General Marshall in Eisenhower's speech that night. They listened in vain. Well. <clears throat> the journalists who were expecting this now wrote up very unflattering remarks in the press. They tore into Ike for appeasing McCarthy. Adlai Stevenson, of course, did the same thing. But the man who was roused to an apoplectic state of fury was, of course, President Harry Truman. He adored George Marshall. And he was outraged at Eisenhower's decision to put party politics above personal loyalty. And Truman, you know, was on the campaign trail, uh, uh, working hard for Stevenson. He wasn't running, of course, for himself. He was working on Stevenson's behalf. He was giving speeches all over the country. And he laid into Eisenhower as a result of this. Truman said that Eisenhower, quote, has betrayed himself. He has betrayed himself. He'd surrendered to, quote, moral pygmies, like Senator Joseph McCarthy. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's more like it. Truman. Maybe he went too far. Truman went after uh, Ike for abandoning Marshall. Quote, what do any of us say about a fellow who joins hands with those who have tried to stab an honored chief in the back? He's saying Ike just stabbed Marshall, his own honored chief in the back. Quote, such moral blindness brands the Republican candidate as unfit to be president of the United States. No wonder that Truman and Eisenhower never reconciled. They did not speak on that famous day in January 1953 when Eisenhower was sworn in. The relationship was frosty for the rest of their lives. Now, a lot of this political drama didn't perturb General Marshall too much. As Charles Bowen put it so memorably in his memoir, quote, politicians were a race that Marshall got along with but just didn't understand. When Eisenhower chose to go into politics, I think Marshall assumed that he would now do dumb things because that's what politicians usually do. <laughs> After Ike was elected president, Marshall wrote a brief and cordial note to Eisenhower upon his victory and said, quote, I pray for you in the tremendous years you are facing. And I think he was sincere about that. He also said the most important decision you will now make is who you will surround yourself with. Pick the best people you possibly can. Well, Eisenhower needed those prayers because he faced, of course, an enormous number of, of complicated challenges. But also, the McCarthy problem didn't go away. And I want to finish by, by, by uh, uh, characterizing Eisenhower's handling of the McCarthy problem as president from 1953 until middle of 1954. At the time, in that period, 53, 54, the press continued to hound Eisenhower as being too weak on McCarthy. Nobody did it better than her block. By the way, when I was speaking, as so we started out with, uh, with personal stories, when I, my first job out of college was as a news aide in the Washington Post. I, I was literally filling the staplers and sharpening the pencils, um, carrying copy from one side of the room to the other. This was in the, around 1986. Herblock was still working for the Post. He was still there drawing cartoons. And 
there he was. It was just extraordinary. But so this is just one of dozens of unbelievably brilliant uh, characterizations of McCarthy. Here he is with a giant bleeding, you know, hatchet. Uh, a comedic cleaver, I should say, and there's Eisenhower pulling a feather out, saying, you know, on guard, or have a care, sir. You know, you, you're not going to defeat McCarthy with a feather, that's for sure. That was the impression that the press had, that Ike wasn't, wasn't really trying very hard. But the point is, the Republicans had the majority in the Senate, and, and as a result, Senator McCarthy had the chairman, chairmanship of a committee. The Committee on Government Operations, and he used it to call witnesses and launch fishing expeditions in search of damaging, damaging or embarrassing material. Boy, those people back then, how, how provincial they were to use Congress to launch fishing expeditions. <laughs> Boy, we've, we've learned our lesson, that's for sure. Eisenhower tried to stay above the fray. He tried to ignore McCarthy. Um, he, he hoped he'd disappear, but he didn't. McCarthy opposed a number of Eisenhower's uh, key appointments. In fact, the aforementioned Charles Bolin was nominated as ambassador to Moscow, and uh, McCarthy opposed it. And he made a big fuss, said, oh, yeah, Bolin, he's one of Atchison's boys. He's one of Truman's boys. Terrible. He's a, probably a communist. He also hinted that uh, Bolin might have some dubious uh, sexual preferences. And they, he, 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 um, he helped to launch a scandalous accusations about Bolin, all of which were false, but which the FBI had to rebut. So it was just... It's about embarrassment. It's about causing embarrassment for, your, for everybody. That was McCarthy's strategy. And I think his constant attacks did have a certain effect on Eisenhower in this way. Eisenhower was very hawkish on the Red Scare. One of his first acts, you all will remember, is that um, uh, Eisenhower approved the execution of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg in the electric chair, both of them, husband and wife for uh, spying, uh, for uh, having helped to pull secrets out of the uh, Los Alamos uh, atomic bomb project, despite a nationwide uh, plea for clemency and campaign for clemency. Eisenhower also imposed a harsh loyalty security program of his own. None of this, though, was enough to appease McCarthy. You could never go far enough to make him happy. He wasn't interested in being appeased. At the end of 1953, he told the press that Eisenhower had, quote, a poor batting average on rooting out communists. So he doesn't care. Isn't this interesting? Eisenhower is worried about party unity. You think McCarthy cares about party unity? He's attacking his own party's leader, the President Eisenhower. Poor batting average in rooting out communists. He criticized Ike for the armistice in Korea, rather than waging atomic war against China. So ignoring or appeasing McCarthy just would not work to pull the, 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 the teeth out of this very rabid animal. But in early 1954, McCarthy makes a mistake. And it's a mistake that Eisenhower did have the sense to pounce on, and it would end up in the, in the, uh, the, de the denouement would come with McCarthy's defeat. You probably know the story. In late 53, McCarthy begins to hold hearings about the security policies of the U go after If you're going to go after someone big, go after the biggest guy in the room, right? The US Army. He's going to go after the security policies of the U.S. Army. And he charges that various left-leaning officers had been allowed to work at, inside the Army, maybe even had been promoted inside the Army bureaucracy. So he hauls in various figures to come in and ask them about communist penetration of the U.S. Army. And in the course of these hearings, McCarthy calls General Ralph Zwicker before his committee and presses him for answers about personnel decisions on his watch. General Zwicker was a decorated combat veteran of the D-Day landings. He was unable to provide adequate details in response to McCarthy's questioning, and McCarthy shouted at him and said, you're not fit to wear the uniform of the United States Army. The public shaming of a senior and decorated uh, army officer outraged Eisenhower. And it seems to have triggered at long last a determination to get tough on McCarthy. Working with his team of advisors, Eisenhower took two careful steps that would prove decisive in hurting Joseph McCarthy. First, he approves a plan to, re to release to the press a damaging dossier of material. I'm telling you, sometimes history just has a way of repeating itself, doesn't it? <laughs> a damaging dossier of material that had been compiled by the Army. McCarthy, the dossier showed, along with his lawyer, Roy Cohn, uh, I don't need to say it, had been using their influence to badger the army to give a sweetheart appointments and plum assignments 
to Roy Cohn's special friend, Corporal David Shine. The Cohn and McCarthy were using their influence to call the army up and say, you better look after him and you better not give him a bad job and make sure he's not doing kitchen duty and make sure he's got a nice plush office, et cetera, et cetera. Cohn had made dozens, dozens of foul-mouthed, angry calls to army officials demanding plum assignments for David Shine. And the army, which is really good, if it's good at anything, it's good at paperwork, noted down every single phone call. <laughs> It was a clear case of abuse of power, and it would lead to the opening of an investigation of McCarthy himself. The famous Army McCarthy hearings, in which, for once, it was McCarthy who was on defense. But that was not all. Eisenhower also knew that McCarthy might try to embarrass the administration, as he did so well, so frequently, by bringing to his committee administration officials and then embarrassing them by having some hint of incriminating material, going on, attacking them. So Eisenhower took an extraordinary step of invoking executive privilege and blocking any executive branch official from testifying during the Army McCarthy hearings. He said, information and advice that was given to me by my advisors will not be coming under consideration and, and investigation by the, by the Congress because I respect the d division between the, the, bra the, ex the branches. Executive has the privilege of this and we will not be hearing from my people. So why did, was this so important? It immediately cut off McCarthy's source of victims. What he wanted was to bring out people out of, out of the White House put him up on the stand and embarrass them and humiliate them. And he was very good at that, had done it for four years. Eisenhower said, that stops now. You don't get to talk to any of my people. Well, constitutional challenge or not, McCarthy was suddenly out of ammo. He had no more victims that he could bring forward, or no, no, none of the really juicy ones. Now, the Army McCarthy hearings, they ground along. They went on for another couple of months. They were televised, and the public got to see just what a mean, vindictive, angry, and really unwell man Joseph McCarthy was. But there were no new revelations. And at long last, the Senate itself began to turn against him. And on June 1, 1954, a conservative Republican senator from Vermont named Ralph Flanders stood in the well of the Senate and denounced McCarthy in scorching language. He said his demagoguery completely parallels that of Adolf Hitler, a conservative Republican saying this. So much for party unity. Indeed, the Republican Party was split right down the middle over McCarthyism. Within weeks, a resolution of censure was put before the Senate, and at the end of the year of 1954, it passed. 22 old guard Republicans voted against it, right down to the end, supporting McCarthy. But it passed. Well, what about Ike? It was not until late that summer of 1954 when McCarthy was already badly wounded, already was sort of bleeding out, that Eisenhower felt able to speak out openly and publicly against him. The occasion was yet another McCarthy slander against George Marshall. McCarthy read into the congressional record some critical statements about, that had been made by somebody else about Marshall. And Eisenhower finally, finally gave the full-throated defense of Marshall that so many people had expected earlier. He waited for the press conference. The, press, the question came, what did you make of McCarthy saying this about General Marshall? Eisenhower said, quote, there are some things that cause me to become almost emotional. <laughs> Doesn't have quite the ring I think he intended it to have. But if you knew Ike, and the press did, they would have seen the fury in his face. He famously had a very, very red complexion when he got angry. He had real trouble mastering his anger um, throughout his life. And one senses from that sentence that he was about to go nuclear. And that's what he, that's what he meant by saying, I'm becoming almost emotional. And everybody in the room you know, rubbed their hands and said, get out your pads, because this is going to be good. Well, it wasn't quite so good, but what he did say was, he went on to say that Marshall typified all that we call an American patriot. He had compiled, Eisenhower said, a brilliant record. The president concluded, it is a very sorry reward at the end of 50 years of service to this country to say that he, General Marshall, is not a loyal, fine American. 
Well, down in Leesburg, Virginia, at the now quiet Marshall home, General and Mrs. Marshall took note of this. This firm, but perhaps overdue, presidential vote of confidence. It was a kind of vindication that Eisenhower had made a public statement of support for Marshall. The Marshalls, their correspondence reveals, correspondence that has been beautifully curated and published uh, right here, the Marshall Library. Um, the Marshalls were genuinely pleased, and they reported to friends that they'd been deluged with, quote, calls and wires and flowers and newspaper clippings, noting Eisenhower's statement. Marshall was not a politician, but he did possess the same pride in his work that any uh, figure who had worked so selflessly for so long for his country would naturally feel. It had been a bruising and frankly surreal experience to become the punching bag for a demagogue like McCarthy. And at last, after the summer of 1954, Marshall could feel as if the whole bad dream was, becoming, was coming to a close. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think this story about Ike, Marshall, and McCarthy reminds us of two things. First, that in America we have a long and tragic history of politicians who use fear and xenophobia, falsehoods and slander to their benefit. Richard Hofstetter, the political scientist in 1964, called this, quote, the paranoid style in American politics. He was thinking of the McCarthy period, but he was trying to put it into a larger context. And of course, this paranoid style is with us still today. But also, second, the story tells us something about Dwight Eisenhower. And in my book, I give Eisenhower very high marks overall for his leadership of the country, of the Cold War, and of domestic politics, and indeed of bringing a degree of dignity uh, to, to the White House that I think still stands the test of time. He was a good man, an honest man. He governed with integrity. He faced many crises, and I think used good judgment in many of them. But Eisenhower, unlike General Marshall, was a politician. He, did not, he would not like to hear that from a biographer, but the fact of the matter is he was a very good politician. In confronting McCarthy, he dodged and he weaved. He approached the McCarthy problem as a political not a moral problem. Now, I've tried to explain why Eisenhower made the choice that he did. I think it's e up to each of us individually to judge whether Eisenhower was right. Thank you.